Well, guys, it's your lucky night tonight. We are going to spend some good one-on-one -on -one time with the first fundamental theorem of calculus and really focus on problems that give us initial values. So let's go ahead and title this in our notebook, First Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, if you need to abbreviate FTC, that's fine. And let's rewrite that fundamental theorem down. So let me recall, the integral from a to b of f prime of x dx equals f of b minus f of a. Now let's talk about y again. If you integrate f prime, the question is, who do you get? Well, who do you take the derivative of to get f prime? That would be f. And it's always upper minus lower. So if I integrate f prime, I get f of x, and then it's upper minus lower, so f of b minus f of a. Now our goal tonight is to look at the first fundamental in a new light. So again, this needs to be written out perfectly in your notebook. Now, let's add on another step here. Let's say we want to solve for f of b. My first instinct is to add f of a to both sides. So let's go ahead and nice, nice and neatly, and let's add that to this side. Okay, so obviously... This is gone, and I'm going to just reverse the order here. I'm going to start off with f of b equals, okay, that's all that's left on this side, f of a plus the integral from a to b of f prime of x dx. Okay, hopefully I've done nothing too sneaky. I added this to the other side, so I have added those two together right here, and I wrote my f of b first. Now again, the reason I did this is to look at the first fundamental theorem in another light. And this method is going to be very, very common. So let me just kind of sketch out what this is actually saying. Let's say we have the function from a to b. And we'll say it looks something like this, and we'll call this f prime of x. All right, so my goal was to integrate f prime of x, which means find the area under the curve to the x-axis, okay, from a to b. Now, this f of a, and here's what we need to highlight in our notebook, represents the initial value. And the integral from a to b of f prime of x represents the change in f of x. Okay, so again, we're going to be saying this first fundamental th theorem a little differently. We're going to say f of b equals the initial value plus the change in f. And that's what our goal is to get in our heads tonight. f of b equals initial value plus change in f. All right, so let's carefully copy question one down. If f prime equals 4x cubed minus 3, and f of 2 equals 7, then what is f of 5 equal to? All right, so here's what we're going to have to take out of this. I want you to box this term in, and we're going to label it very carefully. This term they give you is called the initial condition. And then let's box this f of 5 in and make a note that this is what we want to find. Okay, so on 90% of our problems that we see from now on, we're going to have an initial condition and something we want to find. So we're going to set it up with the first fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, so I'm going to say, well, if I integrate f prime, so I'm just going to leave it as f prime of x dx, from where to where? Now think about this. If you were to sketch this out, what do you know? You know f of 2 is 7, and the question is, what is f of 5? So you are integrating from 2 to 5, and now let's apply the first fundamental. If I integrate f prime, who do you get? Who do you take the derivative to get f prime? Well, that's a no-brainer. You get f, and I get f of the upper minus f of the lower. Okay, so again, my first step is just to set up my first fundamental. Now, let's switch things around. You want to find f of 5. So all I'm going to do is add over f of 2, just like we did in that previous problem. So I'm going to say f of 5 equals f of 2 plus the integral from 2 to 5 of f prime of x dx. And this is how I'm going to solve that problem. Okay, so again, I want you to take note. This is the initial value. This is what you want. And notice this initial f of 2 has to match with this lower bound. What you want matches with the upper bound every single time. All right, now we can actually integrate this. Um, so I can say f of 5 equals, do you know what f of 2 is? Well, of course we do. That was the initial condition. f of 2 equals 7. Plus, now I have to integrate f prime. Okay, when I integrate f prime from 2 to 5, let's go back and integrate there, 
Let's see, f prime was 4x cubed minus 3. 4x cubed minus 3. So let's go ahead and integrate that. Let's see, that's going to be x to the 4th over 4, which kills those 4s, minus 3x from 2 to 5. So I've got f of 5 equals 7 plus. All right, I need to do upper minus lower. So I'm going to go 5 minus 15 minus 2 minus 6. 5 minus 15 is negative 10 minus 2 minus 6 is negative 4. So that gets me an addition sign there. So I get a negative 6 plus 7 equals f of 5. So f of 5 equals 1. Okay, so again, if I went too fast, pause it, rewind. I think it's a pretty straightforward idea. Um, and the one thing I want you to get out of today is we're going to kind of skip writing some of these steps here. I'm probably going to skip this first step and just jump into this one. Okay, so the saying you want in your head is the want equals initial plus the integral. What you want equals the initial plus the integral. Say it to yourself again. Want equals initial plus integral. All right, next example. A particle moves along the y-axis with velocity given by v of t equals 3t squared plus 8t for all time greater than zero. If the particle's position, y equals 5, at t equals 0, what is the position of the particle at t equals 4? Okay, so again, if we slow down and just identify things, I think this question will be very simple. So let's just make a note. We're given velocity. That's my 3t squared plus 8t. Okay, the question says, if the particle's position, y equals 5, at t equals 2. Okay, that is your initial condition. So I'm going to make a little IC there. I have an initial condition. At 2, I have a height of 5. And notice it says y-axis. So I'm going to say y of 2 equals 5. And you have to, I mean, that's something you've done since, you know, 9th grade, 10th grade, 11th grade. Write it as a function. y of 2 equals 5. So here's the question. What do you want? So, okay, so I have an initial and I have a want. I want to know what is the position at 4. Okay, so those are the first three things I'm writing down. Now, obviously, you'll start to be able to do those in your head, but the idea is, is that we can identify the initial condition, the want, and the function. Now, the key word to me here is position. Okay, let's jot that down as well. We want position. Okay, so how do you get position if you have velocity? Simply go backwards. You integrate. All right, if I have velocity, I want position, I have to integrate. Okay, so the last thing you're saying to yourself is it's the want equals initial condition plus the change. Okay, want equals initial condition plus the change. So let's write it out. y of 4 is what I want equals my initial condition, y of 2, plus the change. And it's the change in position. So I'm going to integrate from, these have to match, 2 to what I want, 2 to 4, and I'm integrating 3t squared plus 8t dt. Okay. So lots of self-talk, and that's a good thing. You should be talking to yourself in these problems. It's the want equals initial condition plus the change. All right, now we just run through and figure the problem out. So y of 4 equals, what is y of 2? That's the initial condition, so we know that's 5, plus, all right, we'll do some nice integrating. Remember, add and divide, so that's t cubed divided by 3, so that's just t cubed, plus uh, 8t squared divided by 2 is 4t squared from 2 to 4. Okay, so I'm just using that first fundamental and carefully plugging in. Y of 4 equals 5 plus. All right, so I'm going to get 4 cubed plus 4 times 4 squared is 16 minus 2 cubed plus 4 times 2 squared is 4. All right, and we just carefully clean up that math. So I've got y of 4 equals 5 plus, let's see, 4 cubed is 64 plus 64. So that gets me a 128 minus 2 cubed is 8 plus 16 gets me a 24. So I've got 128 minus 24 for a total of 104. And if I add those together, I should get a grand total of 109. So y of 4 equals 109. And that's all there is to it. All right, so a lot of self-talk again. It's want equals initial condition plus the integral of change. Next example. 
a particle moves along the x-axis so that any time t greater than zero, the acceleration is given by sine of pi x over two. If the velocity of the particle is six at t equals zero, then what is the velocity of the particle at t equals three? All right, so hopefully you're con catching that initial condition that's given, okay? So I can say the velocity at time zero is six. All right, so you have to put that into your own lingo, of course. The velocity when the time is zero is six, is means equals six. And the question is saying, what is the velocity at t equals three? So what is v of three? So I hopefully, you know, you're on the same page. We have an initial condition and we have a want. All right, so I'm just going to say that formula in my head. It's what I want, v of three, plus the initial value, I'm sorry, equals the initial value, v of zero, plus the integral. These bounds have to match from zero to three. Now, who are you integrating? Who do you want? Well, we have acceleration and we want velocity, so we have to integrate acceleration. The sine of pi over two times x there, dx. All right, so once I have that, the rest should flow pretty quickly. Um, I'm looking for v of three, so we'll leave that there. I know v of zero is six. Okay, now I have to integrate. Now again, almost every trig function you see at this point is probably gonna be u sub. When you read this, it says the sine of pi over two x. So you need to do an, a u. You clearly have an inside when you say of. So u equals pi over two times x, make sure you pull it out as a fraction, du equals pi over two dx. And again, to solve, I'm just gonna multiply by the reciprocal to get rid of that fraction. So I've got two over pi du equals dx. We'll substitute that in, so plus the integral. Um, so I'm gonna say the sine of u times two over pi du. All right, now the other thing I have to slow down and get are my bounds. Remember, we have to change the bounds into u bounds. So if x is zero, my u bound also becomes zero. I'm just plugging it in this equation. And if x is three, my u bound now becomes three pi over two. All right, so we're ready to integrate that piece. So I'm gonna leave my v of three equals six plus. So let's go ahead and integrate. I'm gonna pull that two over pi out front. The integral of sine, who do you take the derivative of to get sine? Well, of course, that's negative cosine of u from 0 to 3 pi over 2. Plug in that upper bound, uh, so I get 6 plus, I'm going to leave that 2 over pi out front. I get negative cosine of 3 pi over 2 minus negative cosine of 0. Watch that double negative there. So, of course, that's going to turn into a plus. Cosine of three pi over two, I'm just picturing my graph. The cosine of three pi over two is zero, love that number. And the cosine of zero is one. So I get an answer of, let's see, that six plus two over pi times one is two over pi for my final answer. All right, in our next example, they tell us g of x is the antiderivative for f of x. And g of three equals negative five, right, but do not evaluate an expression involving an integral that represents g of seven. Okay, are you starting to get the feel for these initial condition problems? Okay, they always give you something and then they want something. All right, so let's keep this in mind. We know g of three equals negative five. Okay, that's the initial condition. The want is g of seven. Okay, now notice they don't say, you know, f prime equals or g prime equals. They give it to you in a different lingo. All right, so this is the part I want written in your notebook g of x is the antiderivative of f of x. Okay, so what are they saying? Big g of x is, and in is, we use an equal sign, the antiderivative. Well, when we find an antiderivative, we don't take the derivative, we actually take the integral of f of x. Okay, so this is how I wrote it out first. It says g of x equals the integral for f of x. So in my head now I'm saying, okay, integral means who do you take the derivative of to get f of x? Okay, well I would say g prime of x then equals f of x. That's what this is telling me. Okay, f is the derivative of g prime of x. Who do I take the derivative of to get f of x? That would be g, of, g prime of x. 
All right, so let's set her up. Remember, it's your want, so I want g of 7 equals uh, the initial condition, so g of 3, notice those are capital G's there, plus the integral, okay, what's your initial bound to want bound? Okay, now we just have to figure out who we're integrating. If we want to get g of x as an answer, who would we be integrating? Well, g of x is the antiderivative of f of x, so I am integrating f of x dx. And that's all this question says. Was we'll set up, but do not evaluate an integral that will get us g of 7. All right, now this is an old AP question, and they kind of give you a little more information than you need. So I don't think you need to copy it all down, um, but let's I highlight some key points here. A pizza heated to a temperature of 400 degrees Fahrenheit is taken out of an oven and placed in a 75 degree room at t equals 0 minutes. The temperature of the pizza is changing at a rate of negative radical t degrees Fahrenheit per minute. To the nearest degree, what is the temperature of the pizza at t equals 4? All right, so let's start with our wants. What do they want to know? They want to know at 4, what is the temperature? So when t equals 4, the question is, what is the temperature? And the temperature of what? The temperature of the pizza. Okay, so let's highlight that. At t equals 4, what is the temperature of the pizza? Now let's talk about the initial condition. Okay, at what time? At t equals 0, what do they tell you? Okay, do you care about this 75 degree room or a pizza heated to 400 degrees? Which one is the one of importance to us? Do you really care how warm the room is? No, the whole question is about temperature of a pizza. So at t equals 0, Okay, it says when the time starts there, the pizza is 400 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, so the little bear trap they threw at you was they told you the temperature of this room, which you don't need at all. All right, so let's set up our problem. Um, I want is, and I'm going to, uh, it says what is the temperature of the pizza? Let's use like big T, capital T for temperature. I want to know the temperature at 4, given an initial condition, the temperature at 0, plus the integral from, make sure those match, 0 to 4, and I'm integrating negative 3 radical t dt. Okay, now let's talk about what else gives this away. Notice the units on this puppy. I have degrees Fahrenheit per minute. Okay, so let's say degrees Fahrenheit per minute. When I integrate, okay, I'm taking away, I'm doing the antiderivative, I am going to lose the per minute, and I'm just going to get Fahrenheit. And I should have everybody about Fahrenheit. Okay, so T of 4 equals, the temperature at 0 is 400 plus, now let's go ahead and integrate this. I'm going to rewrite this as T to the 1 half. So I'm going to say that's T to the 3 halves times 2 thirds. So that gives me a negative 3 from 0 to 4. So T of 4 equals 400 plus, uh, I'm going to do real careful here. I've got negative 3 times 4 to the 3 halves minus negative 3 times 0 to whatever is all 0. Remember, we're doing the square root of 4 is 2, and 2 cubed is 8. So that gets me negative 24 plus 400. So at t equals 4, I can safely say I have a temperature of 384 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so one thing that's pretty special that we haven't spent too much time on are the units now. We know when we take a derivative, we add on that per, but when we integrate, we take it off. So if I had degrees Fahrenheit per minute, I'm going to lose my per when I integrate, and I'm just going to get degrees Fahrenheit. All right, now the AP loves to ask these initial condition problems graphically as well. All right, so you probably, um, some people like to screen capture this and you can just, you know, paste it and cut it in your notebook or you can kind of sketch it out as best you can there. Um, but let's get that neatly sketched, so pause it for a moment and sketch it in there. All right, well, welcome back. This says, the graph of f prime. So the first thing I do is I go and I label this f prime just so I keep everybody straight. The derivative of f is shown in the figure above. If f of 1 equals 5, that's key, and that's what I'm going to jot down here also. Okay, I always want that to stick out to me. They are giving me an initial condition. Okay, so let's be very clear. f of 1 equals 5 is the initial condition. Now, notice they're not telling you on this graph f of 1 is 5 because this is a graph of f prime. But on the graph of f, the height is 5. That's all this is saying. 
This again is a graph of slopes, f prime. Find the following. Okay, now I think you're absolutely crazy if you don't sit here and get area for every single one of these sections, all right? Because you don't want to recalculate it over and over. So let's quickly talk through the area, which again, I know everybody knows how to do, but let's walk through it one last time. Uh, what is the base of this triangle? Okay, now remember, some of you like to count one before you move. One, two, three, four. That has a base of four, and my height, remember, has to be perpendicular, so I'm actually going to draw my height in. I would say that has a height of two. Always heights are positive. And it's one-half base times height, so I would say this is an area of negative four, and I hope you would agree with that. Why is the negative on there? Okay, It's underneath the x-axis, so we're going to slap a negative on that bad boy. Um, I like to break these up into triangles. Okay, so I'm going to do two separate triangles. I'm going to get those first. This is 1 by 3 for an area of 3, whoops, three over 2. Uh, this section is 2 by 3 for an area of 3. Notice it's positive, it's above. All right, now for the ugly section. Is this a shape that you're familiar with? I certainly hope not. It's not a triangle, trapezoid, circle, etc. But what you can do is you can build, and we've talked about this before, you can build a rectangle around it and you can take out this area of the circle and if you cut that away, you will be left with this section. Okay, so off to the side, let's do a little arithmetic here. What is the base of that rectangle? One, two, three, four. So I have a base of four and a height of three. Okay, so that gives me a whole area of 12. Now I don't want the whole area, I want just this weird section. So I've got to take this piece out. And by take out, we mean subtract. Okay, and that's half of a circle. One half pi, and it's radius squared. Well, the radius from here to here is 2. 2 squared is 4. So I would say this section here is 12 minus 2 pi. Okay, and I hope you would agree with that. Um, let's go get this triangle. 1 half base times height. Base is 3. Height is 2. Gets me an area of negative 3. And we got a nice little rectangle, area of negative 2 there. Okay, if you like a trapezoid, you can do that, but I like breaking it up into triangles and rectangles. Now, once you have that, these questions should flow pretty quickly. All right, just watch that initial condition. Remember, it's what you want equals the initial condition plus the change in the integral. All right, so I want f of 5 equals the initial condition, which is f of 1. Therefore, my integral goes from, these are match, 1 to what I want. And who are you integrating? Who are you finding the area of to get f? Well, you would have to integrate f prime. Okay, so I'm going to say f of 5 equals, f of 1 is 5 plus. All right, now I need the area from 1 to 5, and you just look at your picture because it's already labeled, 12 minus 2 pi. Uh, so that's going to get me 17 minus 2 pi for f of 5. And that's simple. Hopefully you start to find these a little fun. I think they're a little exciting to play with here. All right, let's do the same thing. Let's go get f of 0. Okay, so I'm going to say f of 0 is what I want equals my initial condition, f of 1 plus the integral. Who has to go on the bottom? The initials go on the bottom to what you want. And if you want f, that means you better integrate f prime of x. Okay. All right, now, do you see a bear trap? I hope you do. I hope you notice right away that those bounds are backwards. So I'm going to say f of 0 equals f of 1, and I'm going to, if I want to switch them, that's fine, I just have to throw a negative in front, 0 to 1 of f prime of x dx. All right, so just be careful on those little bear traps there. All right, so I've got, let's see, f of 0 equals, we know f of 1 is 5 minus the integral from 0 to 1. If I look at that picture, I'm going to say 5 minus 3 halves. I'm really going to call 5 10 halves, and 10 halves minus 3 halves gets me a 7 halves. All right, so same example here. We're going to stick two more on here. All right, I just kind of copied and pasted mine. We want to get f of 11. All right, so this is your time to shine. Pause it, work it out, see if it matches with mine. So good luck. Pause it and talk to me in a few seconds. Hopefully yours matches with mine. I ended up getting 15 minus 2 pi. If not, you can see what I've added together. Um, again, f of 1 is the initial condition, initial bound. 
f of 11 is what I want, want bound on top. All right, let's say my deal, let's go get f of negative 4. So f of negative 4 is equal to the initial condition plus the integral from 1 to negative 4 of f prime of x dx. Okay, so again, I just want to be very clear. This initial condition and initial bound match the want, and the want is the upper bound. Make sure those match. Now, of course, you're falling into that bear trap. Be careful. Make sure you take those and switch them because those bounds are not in proper order. So I'm just going to put a negative out front. Negative 4 to 1 of f prime of x dx. Okay, so really be careful on those. Make sure you catch uh, any flipping that needs to be done. So I know f of 1, we said, is 5 plus, I'm counting from, oh, I'm sorry, minus. I need the area from negative 4 to 1. So that's a negative 4 and a positive 3 halves. Okay, notice I'm being real careful with that negative in front of all that, and I used a bracket to represent that. So I have f of negative 4 equals 5 minus, let's see, I'm going to call that negative 8 halves. So that gives me a negative 5 halves. So I'm going to add that. I'm going to call that 10 halves. So I get 15 halves. And hopefully you agree with that. Well, that's going to do it for us tonight. So be careful with this new initial condition problems. We're going to see a lot of these. Um, and just kind of remind yourself, it's the want equals the initial condition plus the initial bound to the want bound. Okay? Well, good luck, and we'll see you tomorrow. Have a great night.